I will share uh, 5 useful tips that will make you feel uh, more confident when uh, working on your project. One of the first uh, thing you'll do when uh, starting a new project uh, is uh, prepare and uh, organize files and packages. Usually you'll have your project files uh, separated in uh, multiple layers where uh, each one of them has uh, separate concerns. If you have uh, multiple modules in your project, however, then you will apply those layers uh, multiple times. One thing to point out here is that uh, there is no uh, one perfect solution for everything. The package structure also depends on your project requirements, architecture and other factors. I have prepared uh, one diagram to show you how I do organize my project uh, most of the time. So feel free to comment down below and let me know how you do organize your project. Alright, so the first layer is a data layer. Here we are defining the logic that we need to interact with both local and the remote data sources. When we are talking about the local persistence, uh, we can differentiate two sources, one from the database and the other from the persistence libraries like a data store and a shared preferences. Preferences are used mostly for a small key and value pairs. And remote package on the other hand holds the logic for requesting data over the internet. Below that, I do like adding a whole new package specifically for a managing dependency injection. Then we have a domain where we can define the skeleton of a different model classes as well as repositories. After that, we have navigation package. I do like placing navigation graph here along with a new destination package where I am adding a parent function for each screen to which I like hoisting all the logic for using the nav controller for example. That way, I don't need to pass the nav controller all the way down in the hierarchy. If you are having a multi-modular project, however, then each feature in your module will hold those destinations, while the app module would hold the nav graph and the nav controller to handle the navigation itself. Next, we have a presentation layer. So I do like having a component directory where I define all components that are used by multiple screens in my application. Then inside the screen directory, another directory for each screen. Also, inside the each screen, I do prefer adding another component directory where I am declaring all components that are unique only for those single screens. And the optional model package if there are certain model classes also unique for this single screen. After that, we have a UI package which holds theme Kotlin file, typography and colors. At the end, Util package that contains uh, some utility extension functions, constants and other useful functionalities. The second tip that I want to share here is uh, related to holding uh, multiple states in a Jetpack Compose. So let's say that you have uh, one complex uh, screen in your application that has a, a bottom sheet, multiple cards, images, alert dialog, floating action button and other custom or uh, library components. In that case, you probably need to handle a bunch of different states for that single screen. This is how your screen composable would look like. So various uh, different states defined one by one. Depending on the complexity of your application, the number of states that you need to hold can be even multiple times larger than this. In that case, what you would do is uh, create a, a separate data class and place uh, all those uh, states inside. Now, we could also improve this example by placing only a single state instead of those five. That way, our composable screen will look more cleaner. So, when updating each property from the UI state, you would just copy an existing one and target a specific state that you need to. Pretty convenient. You can see that the states that we are holding in our composable screens are closely related to the UI. They allow you to manage the UI state according to the user interaction. Those kind of states should be placed inside the composable functions, which is totally fine. So you don't have to manage them from the view model. View model is used for the business logic instead. The third tip will teach you that UI events should flow from the UI to the view model and you should keep the ViewModel logic private as much as possible. 
instead of referencing the business logic from the UI by obtaining the instance of the view model, you should send the UI events from the UI and trigger the logic from there. You would want to expose only the data that needs to be observed directly from the UI. That way, the UI will automatically react to the data changes that it has subscribed to. Let me show you an example. So here in the view model, we will declare a UI event seal class that will contain all different kind of interactions and the business logic that the user can trigger in a specific screen. So we have a basic insert, update and delete operations. Then, as a dummy data source, I have added a list of strings to represent some kind of a data. Below that, we have three functions used to insert, update and delete an element from the list. And finally, we will add another function to handle the user action from the UI. You can see that here we are only exposing the data and all other business logic functions are private and can be triggered only from the inside. The only function which is exposed is the one for handling the UI events. In the composable screen, initialize a view model, observe the data property, and in the onclick lambda, trigger one of those uh, available UI events. There you go, as simple as that. The next one is about uh, composables and uh, their respective states. So, composables uh, should be focused and uh, perform a specific UI related task without uh, unnecessary complexity. This means avoiding uh, overly long and uh, unreadable composable functions that uh, do try to do too much. Instead, aim for the simplicity and the clarity in your composables. Keeping them as short and as straightforward as possible while still accomplishing their intended purpose. Composables should ideally be stateless when they can, meaning that they don't hold or manage any internal mutable state. Instead, they should rely on input parameters to determine their output. This uh, statelessness uh, makes composables uh, more predictive, testable and reusable. The next uh, tip might be quite obvious, but uh, we do often forget to document a specific part of our project. Sometimes it can happen that we are working on a tricky and uh, a bit complex logic which uh, couldn't be easily understood at first sight. And uh, even if it could, there is a uh, high probability that uh, somewhere in the future, if we revisit this uh, same project, we may forget uh, what's the purpose of that function, and it could take a while to remember. It is important to make uh, clear documentation and explain its purpose well, so that the uh, next time, after a few months or even a year, we could easily remember just by looking into that same documentation. And uh, lastly, I have one more extra tip to share with you. It's called a regular code review and a refactoring. Someone might call it a rule of three as well. When you code something for the first time, just do it. The second time, you repeat it, but stay alert. The third time, stop and refactor. This rule helps you make a balance between a too early abstraction, which can lead to overly complex architecture and excessive code duplication, making the project difficult to maintain. This approach helps develop a maintainable code while avoiding the pitfalls of over-engineering or under-engineering your solutions. What do you think about that? Do you have some more tips to suggest? Let me know in the comment section down below. Other than that, be sure to like this video, but only if you find it helpful. Thank you for watching.